Hi, I'm Alex and welcome to Super Make Something Basics. Today, we take a look at how to properly size traces on your custom circuit boards. This episode is sponsored by PCBWay. Follow the link in the video description below to order custom circuit boards for your projects at PCBWay.com. I'm currently working on creating an open source actuator to make it easier for people to get started with robotics. Like with my previous DIY Stream Deck project, my goal is to make the actuator as easy as possible for others to build for themselves, so I'm again designing a custom printed circuit board, or PCB, that will allow anyone to replicate the electronics portion of this build even if they only have basic soldering skills. Designing and laying out circuit boards is one of my favorite parts of DIY electronics projects. Fitting all of the circuit connections onto a tiny board, and routing the wire traces to make sure that everything is connected correctly is like a miniature puzzle, and is not only super satisfying when everything works as intended, but also creates a really cool looking graphic when the board is fully laid out. After I finished my initial actuator circuit board layout, I therefore took a screenshot of my PCB design software and excitedly posted it online, where I received the following surprisingly consistent feedback. Not today! <laughs> my circuit board traces were too thin. While the internet often has vastly differing opinions on basically everything, the consistency of these comments made me wonder, how do you properly size circuit board traces? So, with some basic electronics components, circuit boards from PCBWay, and a thermal imaging camera from Banggood.com, I set off to learn how to correctly size my circuit board traces to make sure that this and future boards were as well designed as possible. As with most things in our universe, the answer to why does it matter how wide your circuit board traces are is heat. Circuit boards essentially exist to carry electricity from one electronics component to another. As electricity, or more precisely current, travels along the various traces on a board, heat is generated due to a process known as joule heating. Traces on a PCB are typically made of copper. As electrons move through a trace, they bump into copper ions in their path, transferring some of their energy and causing the copper ions to vibrate. This vibration causes the PCB trace to warm up over time. The idea behind correctly sizing a circuit board trace is to make sure that this heat can be transferred to the environment quickly enough before the trace gets too hot and the circuit board fails. While the maximum temperature before the fiberglass layer on a typical PCB begins to soften is around 130 degrees Celsius, which is known as the glass transition temperature, it's usually a good idea to keep the temperature well below this limit, both for component and user safety. So how do you actually size a PCB trace? The answer to this question can be found in the IPC 2221, a 130 page technical document that covers nearly every aspect of printed circuit board design. Charts that relate current, cross-sectional area, and temperature rise for internal and external traces can be found in figure 6-4. From these charts, it's possible to create the following equation using regression, which can then be used to calculate trace width by knowing the density of copper used by the circuit board manufacturer during the PCB fabrication process. In my board design, I knew that the copper density would be 1 ounce per square foot, that the maximum current through my biggest trace would be around 2 amps, and that I wanted a maximum temperature increase of 10 degrees Celsius. Since this would be a relatively simple breakout board, I also knew that my PCB would only have two layers, meaning that all of the traces would be external, which allowed me to select the appropriate curve coefficients. From this, I was able to calculate that the required trace width for this portion of the board would be 30 mils. But exactly how accurate are trace width values reported by these design curves? Armed with this new information, I opened up Altium Designer, which I used to design the original version of the actuator board, and changed the width of the traces that would supply power to the board and motors to 30 mils. A quick thank you to Altium for providing the Altium Designer software for me in order to make PCB designs for my videos. If you're interested in trying out Altium Designer for yourself, simply follow the link in the video description below for a free 30-day trial. After I had exported the PCB fabrication files, I next headed to PCBWay.com, who graciously sponsored this video. On the site, I uploaded a zip file of all of my fabrication files, selected the appropriate manufacturing options to match the settings I had used in my trace width calculations, and submitted the order. Less than a week later, the boards arrived at my door, and like always, they were absolutely perfect. Over the last year, I've exclusively had boards for all of my electronics projects manufactured through PCBWay, and have always been pleased with the results. In case you're looking for a circuit board manufacturer for your next project, consider checking out PCBWay. 
Their speed, price, and quality can't be beat. With the boards in hand, it was time to test the accuracy of the IPC2221 design curves. To avoid risk to my actuator components and control the amount of current accurately, I used a set of resistors to simulate the maximum electrical load of my motors, whose value I calculated using an expression for Ohm's law. When fully built, I knew that the circuit would be powered with a 12 volt power supply. To get 2 amps to run through the trace, which is the maximum current that can be supplied by the motor driver, I would therefore need a 6 ohm resistor. However, a variation of Joule's first law states that the power dissipated through a load is equal to the current times the voltage, meaning that I would need a resistor that could dissipate at least 24 watts to make sure that it wouldn't burn up during testing. As such, the quarter watt resistor commonly found in standard electronics kits wouldn't do, so I headed online and picked up a shiny 6 ohm 50 watt power resistor which would be more than capable to survive this experiment. After soldering the resistor and some wire to the board's 30mm traces, I connected everything to a benchtop power supply. The temperature increase of the trace was measured with an HGI thermal imaging camera which was sent to me by banggood.com for these tests. After mounting the camera onto a tripod using its quarter 20 screw interface, I first measured the ambient temperature of the board. Next, I turned on the power supply, set its output to 12 volts, and began monitoring the temperature increase of the PCB region that contained the wired trace. One thing to note is that the traces on the PCB also have a slight internal resistance that is a function of their length. As such, I needed to increase the output voltage of my power supply in order to get 2 amps to flow through the circuit. After approximately 10 minutes, the board had reached steady state temperature, and I recorded a final reading of 25.1 degrees Celsius, a temperature increase of 6.3 degrees. So what exactly does this result mean? Overall, the measure temperature rise in the trace was less than the temperature rise predicted by the equations derived from the IPC2221 design curves. This means that the traces were adequately sized to handle the amount of current to stay beneath the desired 10 degrees Celsius temperature increase, and is great news for the open source actuator project, because the PCB should be able to stay cool even under the worst case operating conditions. However, the difference between the predicted 10 degree and measured 6.3 degree Celsius increase is not trivial, so it's equally important to understand why this discrepancy may exist. First, the IPC2221 design curves incorporate a 10% derating factor to allow for variations during PCB manufacturing, which creates a bit of a safety margin in case the copper density of a trace is a bit lower, or the trace width ends up being a bit narrower than intended when a PCB is manufactured. Next, there is likely also a bit of measurement error between the actual temperature and measure temperature reported by the thermal camera. While I was not able to verify the thermal camera's absolute accuracy, I did sanity check the camera's reported values by measuring the temperature of one of my 3D printer's heated beds. During these tests, I found that there was about a 0.8 degree difference between the value reported by the camera and the printer, which is in line with the plus or minus 2% or plus or minus 2 degrees Celsius temperature measurement accuracy of the camera. The value reported by the printer is likely also not perfect, but this could leave only around 0.8 degrees of unaccounted for temperature from things like uncharacterized convective cooling effects, uncertainty in the voltage and current reported by my power supply, and from PCB weight actually using slightly more copper in the traces than indicated in their online ordering form to add a bit of extra safety margin. With all of that being said, it's always important to do your own validation experiments when making circuit boards that have to adhere to tight performance specifications for your own application. However, these results suggest that the width of the motor traces in the open source actuator PCB are adequately sized, and that the IPC2221 guidelines for trace width provide a conservative estimate for two-sided circuit boards manufactured by PCBWay that, from a thermal standpoint, will allow your circuit boards to perform safely in your projects. Based on this limited testing, the IPC2221 specs seem to provide good rules of thumb for properly sizing your circuit board traces. A big thank you to PCBWay for supplying boards for this experiment, and to banggood.com for providing a thermal imaging camera for this video. The camera seems to provide accurate temperature measurements, and I can see it being an extremely handy tool for both electronics troubleshooting and 3D printer benchmarking. Please check out the links in the video description below if you're looking to have some PCBs made for your next project, or are interested in picking up the thermal imaging camera for your toolbox. Having validated that the boards will be able to handle the motor current, it's now time to start designing mechanical components for the open source actuator. If you'd like to support that build, or found this video useful, please consider giving me a like, subscribing to my channel, and becoming a patron on Patreon or a member on YouTube.
Your support helps me make more of these videos and ensures that my content will always be free to help others learn more about 3D printing, electronics, and other topics covered on this channel. Well, that's all there is to this episode. Thanks for watching. Now go super make something.